Figure one shows a gas discharge tube devised by William Crookes in one of his investigations. When a large potential difference is applied between the cathode and anode, the paddle wheel is seen to rotate and travel along the rail towards the anode. So we've got figure one there with the tube containing the paddle wheel with the cathode on the left and the anode on the right. Explain how this experiment led Crookes to conclude that cathode rays are particles and that these particles cause the movement of the paddle. Now for this to work, we need those cathode rays to contain matter particles, which can impart momentum onto that wheel. So the first thing to say is that the electrons move towards the anode from the cathode. And that's going to be your first mark. Your second mark will be for saying that the wheel gains energy from those electrons. Now you could also say momentum or impulse as well, but energy is fine. And that's going to be your second mark. So two marks there. Later experiments showed that cathode rays are electrons in motion. Explain how cathode rays are produced in a gas discharge tube. So in this question, we just need to describe that process of cathode rays being produced or electrons being produced. And the first thing to say here is that the gas atoms are ionized, i.e. they lose electrons. The next thing to say is that electrons are emitted from that cathode. And then finally, we can say that the potential difference causes the electrons to be accelerated toward the anode. Now you can see I've made three points there, so three marks. In a particular gas discharge tube, air molecules inside the tube are absorbed by the bulbs of the tube. Suggest the effect that this absorption may have on the motion of the paddle wheel. Give a reason for your answer. Now there are two schools of thought with this sort of question. One of them involves the paddle wheel rotating more and the other involves the paddle wheel rotating less. So I'm going to split this answer into two possible sections, starting with the paddle wheel rotating more. Now the thing that would cause the paddle wheel to rotate more is if those air molecules are absorbed by the walls of the tube, then the electrons passing through would have a higher kinetic energy. And you get a mark for saying that. Very generously, you'd get your second mark there for saying that the paddle wheel would rotate more. In terms of the paddle wheel rotating less, what we can say is that there are fewer electrons to collide with the paddle wheel. And that would be your first mark on this side. And again, if you correctly stated that the paddle wheel would rotate less as a result of this difference, then you would get your second mark. So whether you write that the wheel rotates more or whether you write that the wheel rotates less, you will get two marks. Figure two shows the apparatus FISO used to determine the speed of light. We've got figure two there with a light source emitting light which reflects off of a partially reflecting mirror towards mirror M which reflects back through a rotating toothed wheel and then straight through the mirror towards the observer. The following observations are made. Observation A says that when the speed of rotation is low, the observer sees the light returning after reflection by the mirror M. Observation B says that when the speed of the wheel is slowly increased, the observer continues to see the light until the wheel reaches a certain speed. At this speed, the observer cannot see the light. Explain these observations. Now for this question, you can see it's worth two marks, so there'll be one mark available for each observation. So for observation A, if there's a low rotation speed, the light can pass through, rebound off the mirror, and then pass back through the original gap in the wheel and get to the observer before the wheel rotates enough for a tooth to be in the way. And as I said before, that would be your first mark. Let's have a look at observation B. We can see that when the speed of the wheel is slowly increased, the observer continues to see the light until the wheel reaches a certain speed and then they don't see the light. Now the reason for that is that the light is traveling through the wheel initially, reaching the mirror, bouncing back, but by the time it comes back to the wheel, it's rotated enough so that now a tooth is in the way. And that would be your second mark. So both of these answers, as you can see, are about the state of the wheel when the light returns from mirror M. Table one shows data from Fizzo's experiments at the instant when observation B is made. Got table one, which has the distance from M to W of 8.6 kilometers. F is the number of wheel revolutions per second, so that's 12. And then N, the number of teeth in the wheel, is going to be 720.
it can be shown that the speed of light c is given by the equation c equals 4 dnf. Discuss whether the data in table 1 are consistent with the present accepted value for the speed of light. Now if we multiply these together as shown in the equation, your first mark will be for calculating the value obtained by the data and the equation. Your second mark will be for comparing this value to the accepted value, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second when written to two significant figures. So it's worth just noting here that our value of 2.97 times 10 to the 8 meters per second rounds to 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second when written to two significant figures. So those would be your two marks. The speed of the wheel is further increased. Deduce the value of f when the observer would next be unable to see light returning from the mirror. Now for this question, it would be worth drawing a diagram. So these rectangles represent teeth on the wheel. And I also have mirror M. So if we first of all draw the path of the lights when we're first unable to see light returning from the mirror. So the light goes across and then when it returns, it hits the first tooth. Of course, really it would hit the edge of this tooth, but this is a simplified diagram. In another scenario, when the light is next visible, it would rebound off the mirror and then pass back through the next available gap in the teeth. So when the wheel is sped up from when the light is first not visible, the light will eventually be visible again. But speeding the wheel up even further, the light would then hit the next tooth. So in terms of the distance the wheel has rotated for the third scenario compared to the first scenario, i.e. hitting the second tooth compared to hitting the first tooth, the wheel has moved three times as far in the same period of time. So it would need to be traveling at three times the speed. So we need to put this into words in our answer. So that's our first mark. The light must go past the gap and to the next tooth. We then need to provide a new value of f, which compares to the original value of f of 12 revolutions per second. So if the wheel has moved three times the distance in a given time and is therefore traveling at three times the speed, then the value of f must be three times its original value. So three times 12 would be 36. Now for this, you could give an answer in hertz if you wanted to, or rotations per second, but since a rotation isn't technically a unit, seconds to the minus one would also be fine. As an alternative answer, you can provide a clear diagram. So the answer that I've submitted here is probably more than what is needed. Explain how the nature of light is implied by Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic waves and Fizeau's results. So the first thing to say here is about Maxwell's theory. Maxwell's theory of electromagnetic waves predicted a value for the speed of electromagnetic waves. And of course, this speed was consistent with the data collected in Fizeau's experiment. But let's make our first point about Maxwell's theory. And that would be your first mark. The next thing to say, as we saw before, is that Fizeau's result is very close to that predicted speed. And that would be your second mark. Your third mark ties these two points together and states the implication that light is in fact an electromagnetic wave. And that would be your third mark. So three marks there. Figure three shows the main parts of a transmission electron microscope or TEM. And we've got a diagram of the TEM here in figure three. There's very little explanation given here because we're going to have to give that explanation in a later question, as you'll see. So we can see that the electrons are emitted from the electron gun. They pass through three different types of lens, condenser, objective and projector. And they reach the fluorescent screen at the bottom where an image is produced. What is the process by which electrons are produced in an electron gun? Tick the correct box. Now, the answer to this question is thermionic emission because thermionic emission is the process by which a metal is heated up and electrons are brought to the surface. So you'd get your mark for correctly selecting this answer. The electrons in a particular TEM have a kinetic energy of 4.1 times 10 to the minus 16 joules. Relativistic effects are negligible for this electron energy. Suggest with a calculation whether the images of individual atoms can, in principle, be resolved in this TEM. Now our first mark will be obtained for using the equation to find the wavelength of these electrons due to the wave particle duality. Now I'll just add some labels to this. 
So we've got a couple of constants there. The mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and the Planck constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. And you can see the kinetic energy of the electron is put in the denominator of the fraction. So let's substitute our values. And that gives us a value of 2.4 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Of course, this is rounded to two significant figures because that's what's given to us in the question. But your first two marks will be for correctly using this equation and substituting in the values and obtaining a correct wavelength. Your third mark will be for comparing this to the diameter of an atom and deciding whether an image can be resolved. And in this case, it can because the wavelength of the electron is smaller than the diameter of an atom, which is about a tenth of a nanometer. And for making the statement, you will get your third mark. A typical TEM can accelerate electrons to very high speeds and form high resolution images. Explain, first of all, the process of image formation, and secondly, the factors that affect the quality of and the level of detail in the image. So we're going to break our answer down into two parts, firstly talking about image formation. The first thing that we can say is about the path of the electrons traveling through the lenses. Now, as the electrons travel down through these lenses, their position relative to the center will dictate how much their path has changed, much like lights traveling through something like a glass lens. So the electrons traveling straight through the center will be undeviated, just like a beam of light traveling straight through the center of a glass lens, but electrons traveling off to the side will have their path redirected more. So that's going to be our first point. I've also said about magnetic fields as those are the cause of the electron deflection. I'm not going to assign marks here, but I'll explain how the marking process works at the end of the question. The next thing that we can say is about the condenser lens. Now, as you can see in this lens, electrons initially have a diagonal path and their path is redirected so that they travel in a straight line on their way to the sample. So this is what we can write about in the question. We can then look at the objective lens. We can see then that the objective lens changes the beam from being parallel back into diagonal again so that it can cross over to form an image. So let's write about that. And then the last lens to talk about is the projector lens. So we can see that this lens redirects the electrons again so that we cast an image onto the fluorescent screen. And that will be the last thing to write about for the first bullet point. And that's all of the detail we can include for the first section of our answer. The next thing to talk about is the quality of the image and its level of detail and what we can do to change those things. So the first thing to say that if electrons are slower, they will have a larger wavelength and therefore there will be less detail. We can also talk about the cathode in the electron gun that produces the electrons and how the speeds of the electrons will be based on a temperature distribution. Now, as a result of this variation in speed, there will be a variation in direction change of those electrons each time they pass through a lens. So we'll get a sort of aberration effect. And the last thing to say is about the thickness of the sample. And if the sample is thicker, then the electron speed will be reduced a lot more, thus increasing the wavelength and reducing the detail of the sample. So that's our complete answer. It probably contains more detail than you would need to gain six marks in this question. According to the mark scheme, to get six marks, you need three points to be made in each of your two sections. However, the points that I've made, in some cases, combine two of the points which are accepted by the mark scheme. There will also be a mark awarded for spelling and grammar or quality of written communication. So the mark scheme, unfortunately, isn't as simply written as one mark per point. However, it's likely that if you miss a point in either section, there will be a mark lost and it will approximately scale down from there. A student models a spacecraft journey that takes one year. The spacecraft travels directly away from an observer at a speed of 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. The student predicts that a clock stationary relative to the observer will record a time several days longer than an identical clock on the spacecraft. Comment on the student's prediction. Support your answer with a time dilation calculation. So the first thing that we want to do is convert a year into seconds so that we can find out the exact difference in seconds between the proper time and the dilated time. So we get 31,536,000 seconds. Now you won't get a mark for making that calculation, 
but you will get a mark for calculating the dilated time. And this is where the speed comes in. So let's write down the time dilation formula first of all. So let's add some labels to that. So if we put in all of our values, it's worth noting here that T0 on top of the fraction is the proper time, which is the time observed outside of the spacecraft. And that will be the year that we're putting into the equation. And then the dilated time is the elongated time that we want to calculate. So let's substitute our values into the equation. We don't need to rearrange. And that will give us a value of 31,561,259 seconds. And that calculation will give you your first mark. What we then want to do is subtract the length of a normal year from this time to find the difference between the two values and therefore the time dilation. And that will give us a value of 25,259 seconds, which is about seven hours. And that would be your second mark. Now you'll notice that that seven hours is not several days. So whilst it's true that the time observed outside of the spacecraft will be longer, it won't be several days longer. So our third and fourth marks will be for making those points. So that sentence will get you your third and fourth marks. The first part agreeing with the prediction that it will be longer and the second part disagreeing with the prediction that it will be several days. So four marks there. In practice, the gravitational field of the sun affects the motion of the spacecraft and it does not travel directly away from the Earth throughout the journey. Explain why this means that the theory of special relativity cannot be applied to the journey. Now, this is more of a factual explanation, and it goes that the theory of special relativity requires objects to be traveling at constant speeds without acceleration. So that will be our first mark. And that's your first mark. Your second mark will be just stating that if the spacecraft is not always traveling directly away from the Earth, then it won't always be moving in a straight line. Therefore, it must be accelerating in parts of its journey. Now remember that if we're changing direction, even if we're traveling at a constant speed, that still counts as acceleration. So making that statement will be your second mark. So two marks there. Cosmic rays detected on a spacecraft are protons with a total energy of 3.7 times 10 to the nine electron volts. Calculate the velocity of the protons as a fraction of the speed of light. Now the first thing that we need to do is convert that energy from 3.7 times 10 to the nine electron volts into joules. Now that 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 is the charge on an electron. And that gives us a value of 5.9 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. And that's going to be your first mark. To calculate the velocity of the electrons, we need to use Einstein's mass energy equivalents. Now let's just add some labels there. Now remember that the M in this equation is the relativistic mass, and we only have the rest mass of a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So let's substitute in the relativistic mass equation. Now we need to rearrange this equation to make V the subject because we're trying to find the velocity of the protons. Now making the necessary substitutions, which gives us 2.901 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, which is about 0 0.97 times the speed of light. So in terms of the second and the third mark, your second mark will be for correctly using the relativistic mass equation in conjunction with the energy mass equivalents and making the necessary substitutions. And your third mark will be for correctly getting 0 0.97 times the speed of light at the end. So three marks there.